So the question is, how did I go from boxes to curvaceous shapes? After all, all my early home projects were square boxes. So really, what point did that transition occur? It goes back to my days at BMW, of course. I just completed the matrix enclosure and John Bowers said, well, do you have any other ideas? And I said, well, yeah, actually, I've got plenty. Oh. One of the things I was a bit obsessed with was uh, softening the edge. There, there was no hard transition between baffle and free air. You know, the cabinet is there to prevent the inverse polarity sound from the back of the driver mixing with that at the front. But in doing so, in containing the sound, you run the risk of adding all sorts of resonances and reflections. My go-to solution at the time was to put a long pipe on the back of the driver, and actually that worked perfectly well. The thing that became immediately obvious was this might be all right for mid and high frequency drivers, but uh, sticking a parallel-sided tube on the back of, uh, let's say, a 12-inch bass driver was going to be a little bit unwieldy. And that was the point at which I decided, well, above its cutoff frequency, an exponential horn behaves just like a parallel sided tube. Why not put the driver on the end of an exponential horn? And it actually worked uh, as we would hope. But there was one more inventive step which came into it, and that was uh, at the first experiment, I had the exponential horn attached to a short parallel sided tube filled with densely packed fibrous material. It was pretty effective, but you could still see the point at which the wave met the block of uh, absorber. And I just thought, well, what would happen if I were to drag the fibre into the horn itself? And then it would gradually get denser as you got to the thin end. And that turned out to be the solution. It's uh, actually a really effective and virtually ideal way of dissipating the rear sound. I mean, the Nautilus came out in 93. And there's no question that the quirky design, and I'm sure that there must have been some at the time who thought, oh, yeah, just another design exercise. But I think that engineers who would see this thing would have thought, ah, yeah, actually. <laughs> the reaction, of course, when people actually heard it was, oh yeah, this, this definitely <laughs> this does exactly what uh, it was meant to. Uh, but as soon as they recognised, no, this is a serious engineering product, uh, and it doesn't take much explaining before they actually realise, oh, no, this is, this is an interesting and probably the right way of doing things. But the thing that did happen when I started at Vivid Audio, well, actually, it was a little way into Vivid Audio, whereas our first Vivid Audio products, we had exponential horns on the mids and highs, but the bass chamber was a interesting shape, an ovoid sort of shape, but fundamentally it was a chamber and a port. The inventive step, if you wish, was when we were looking at the gear G1, I realised that it was possible to combine the exponential absorber with a base reflex and to get the best of both worlds. And that, you know, it's a simple idea which really worked. There, the actual exact choice of the uh, exponential taper is a little bit more critical. Um, you have to have it roughly four or five times the port tuning frequency. If you, if you have it too much, it doesn't absorb sufficiently. If you have it too low, it uh, damps the port output. But, uh, but still, you know, it's um, very workable. The fact that the Nautilus, uh, which really started all of this, is still in production, I find really quite moving, quite touching. <laughs> um, Yes, it's exactly the same design. It's almost, they treat it with a certain reverence almost. And I, I must admit that the, the Nautilus for me was my starting point. Everything I've done since is uh, a development. In some cases, we've taken the essential elements of Nautilus and packaged them in a smaller or more accessible products. But fundamentally, uh, the principles I learned are, are being applied on all our Vivid products. I mean, actually, <laughs> I'd love to get a chance to put our drivers into the Nautilus. Because <laughs> I know, I mean, I was a relatively young engineer and uh, actually driver design wasn't especially something I'd concentrated on at that point.
when I started with Vivid, that's really when I started to get into um, magnet modeling, uh, improving the, the diaphragm shape, all that sort of thing. So there, there is no question that um, our drivers are an improvement and I'd love to put them in. <laughs>